we get sort of put in this base culture sometimes during auditions and and we know how certain excerpts go in the base culture and how bass players like to play it i think it's really important to get out of that because you know so many times i'd be playing an excerpt and i would listen back and i'm just like oh that sounds like a machine gun there's certain things that we like that don't necessarily translate to other musicians Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath. So glad to have you here today. And visit our site at ContrabassConversations.com for all the details about what's going on here. And I would love to hear from you. Reach out. Send me an email, feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. Let me know a little bit about yourself. Give me a suggestion for the show. That would be great. And I know you're going to enjoy today's episode featuring Caleb Quillen, who's the most recent addition to the double bass section of the Kansas City Symphony. And my plan going forward here with the podcast is to do an interview with people that win double bass auditions and talk through their process. What did they do? How did they prepare? How did they manage challenges and frustrations? What techniques did they discover that move them forward in their auditioning? Those kind of topics. So that's exactly what we do here today with Caleb. We talk about advice he would give his younger self, the processes he went through with his most recent auditions, the concept of cognitive shifting and mental replacement to look at how you're preparing in a helpful light. I love this. This happens later in the interview. I'd also like to thank Diderio Strings, who's sponsoring Contrabass Conversations, and let you know about their Zyx Strings, which I'm using right now. They've got a rich, colorful, gut-like tone. They use a multi-filament synthetic core. You can get them in medium and light gauges. You can get a C extension string. And like all D'Addario strings, Zyx bass strings are designed, engineered, and crafted at the D'Addario String Factory in New York. I'd also like to let you know about the D'Addario Strings giveaway, only for Contrabass Conversations listeners. If you go to ContrabassConversations.com slash strings, you can fill out a survey and get enrolled in this giveaway. So, Thanks for tuning in, and here we go with this excellent interview featuring Caleb Quillen. All right, I am on the line with Caleb Quillen, and we were just talking about when we first met, and these are one of those things that makes me feel super old, but uh, he was playing with his high school orchestra at the Midwest Clinic in Chicago and had a bass solo, some sort of elephant variation, and I remember thinking like, wow, this guy sounds awesome, so went up to the stage and talked with him and... It's it's amazing, like, all these years later, now he just won a job in the Kansas City Symphony. So, uh, welcome to the podcast, man. It's great to have you on. Hey, thanks, Jason. Good to be here. <laughs> yeah, and, and maybe since, since I babbled about your high school a little bit, can you just tell tell folks a little bit about early years, how you got started on the bass, where you went to school, and so, that sort of thing? Yeah, um, I grew up in Sugarland, Texas, which is a suburb outside of Houston, and I started the bass in seventh grade from a teacher at Garcia Middle School was the middle school I went to. And so went from then to, you know, high school, Stephen F. Austin was out there, which is a really great program out there in Sugar Land. You know, Texas is so, so huge for the public schools and especially music. And then my undergrad was at NEC, New England Conservatory in Boston. And I studied with Lawrence Wolf of the BSO and, and Don Palma, one of the co-founders of the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. And went from then to uh, grad school at Rice, where I studied with Paul. And I did, uh, th- now they have like a three year program for masters, or you can do uh, an extra year there. So I did three years there. Um, and then my third year, that January, was when the Kansas City audition happened. So that was the, the last semester I was there. Oh, cool. Well, when did you start taking professional auditions? Was that during your grad school, or when did that start happening? I took. An audition uh, in my junior year at NEC for, I think it was an Alabama Symphony assistant or associate principal. And that was the last audition I took in undergrad. And then I started taking auditions in my second semester at my first year master's at Rice for, uh, I think the audition was Nashville. And then uh, my second year, I started taking more and more auditions. Uh, it took about six, or I think it was six or seven until Kansas City. So a lot of auditions in that second year, I think I took four or five, and then maybe two 
the the third year I was there. In the, everybody, these are the sort of details everybody loves to hear about. Uh, for you, you know, some t- some people I talk to, there's like an aha moment for auditioning where all of a sudden things click. And for some people, it's just sort of this like steady uh, like escalator where it just gets a little better. For, were there any aha moments for you at, in your audition journey? I, I probably a few. I I think a big one that I've been realizing recently is the the type of of slow practice that I was that I was doing, and with that comes this idea of focus. That I don't know. I, I actually it is a really sort of a good example of an aha moment. I was reading a book, and this is a, you know in my master's some book probably Mirakami. I've been really big into that guy, and you know when you're reading and, and you kind of drift in and out sometimes and the focus of reading and hearing those words in in your head and creating conclusions and also thinking about what you're going to eat next or something, you know, that kind of goes in and out. And so that idea of focus during reading, I, I started to think, well, if, if I'm drifting in and out like that with reading, I'm probably doing the same thing when I'm playing in a performance and how could I, sort of get to the point of being so focused that, you know, 100% of the time consistently focused in the excerpt while I'm playing. Because it's hard to find that focus. You know, it's it's a hard idea to just, oh, I'm going to go focus, you know. But actually, like, learning how to do that and finding that spot when you're doing it and then being able to practice that and do it consistently. I think that was a big aha moment for me was just knowing when I would be focused and how to get back into it and basically developing techniques to get to that level of, of focus and performance. Like what, what, what are, what are some of the techniques that you discovered? Well, uh, I think one was making sure that if, if I were to be playing it, I could not have my bass in my hand and be singing the, you know, excerpt or whatever you're playing in my head. And if I'm, Doing that, it's basically, you know, if you're like solfeging something, you're hearing that in your head and it's the same thing, you know, like a brass player has to do that, right? I think that makes it easier to get into that set of focus when you're singing everything that you're doing. But also there's there's a sort of opening your vision up. When I go into a hall, I, I always had myself feeling like I was just sitting in this one spot and it was really close to me playing wise. And I was kind of focusing on this very small space around me. And if I were to just open up my vision to a larger view in the hall, for some reason, I don't know what that affects in the brain. I, you know, uh, but that helped me focus a lot and just opening up that awareness of everything around me, almost like the third person in the audience, like I'm listening from out there. Cool. That no, yeah. what a what a great technique. That that w- did you in your preparation? Did you get the chance to play in some larger spaces, like when you're getting ready for auditions, or was it something you just sort of like something you developed as you played in halls during the audition? Did you get? Did you do a lot of practicing in like a big space? Well, at Rice, we're really lucky to have Studi, and and pretty much you could get in there any time after you know after rehearsals, and any time after basically 7.30. And so when I was preparing for auditions, I would always try to get in there, run some things, put my recorder in the back of the hall, just get a sense of it. It's not a giant hall. I don't know if you've ever been down there, but it's really nice just to have that and know that whenever you go to a hall, it, it's pretty forgiving in there, I would I would say also. So that was a nice thing about it. But yeah, so I had, had that experience. And yeah, getting out of the practice room is definitely a a good thing to do and get into a bigger space if you're if it's available. So like you're in that big space and you record yourself, which is awesome, you know, out in the hall so you can hear. It. And like, how do you crunch that data? Do you listen, just listen to it and just sort of internalize it, or do you like listen and take notes on on how it went? What, what's your process for dealing with recordings? Yeah, um, I, I forget what teacher this is. I, I was watching a master class at NEC. Liz Rowe, she's principal flute in the BSO. And I think she had gotten this from another teacher, but I've forgotten her name now. Recording yourself, if you just listen to it, right, you're just going to think about all the things that are wrong with it. And it's sort of not helpful just to do that. So what she does is, and what I've done recently and in, in past auditions is, you know, come up with categories that I'm listening for so that 
whenever I'm listening to the recording, I'm not just listening to it as a whole, I'm trying to find some kind of thing I'm focusing on, whether it be just intonation or just rhythm, you know, all these categories. And then listen with the idea that you're just listening for that one category. And then at the end, listen to it, you know, again. And it's funny how when you put it into those categories, you start to, it's, it's good because you can specify exactly what you didn't like about the excerpt. It's, it's something to hold on to and not just like it was bad or it was good. You can actually describe, you know, what happened. And sometimes it's surprising that it's actually better than you thought. And it's actually not that much wrong with it. It's just if you categorize it, it makes it easier that way. Yeah, no, I love that. It's like it ob objectifies the data. So it's not just like, oh, I'm a horrible person. I sound bad, whatever. It's like, like uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, when I would listen to recordings, it's just it's it's you take it personally. Right. And and if you're just listening it for that, just listening it, like you said, objectively, that's more helpful to me. And also just getting used to hearing yourself because you're going to be your worst critic, right? And if you just get used to that, you stop taking it personally and you start to actually enjoy the recording process and it becomes more productive that way, I think. What was your kind of overall kind of like zoomed out process like maybe for Kansas City or the last few auditions? I'm assuming if you're like most people, you probably ended up kind of coming up with a routine that worked for you like yeah. two, three months out. What, what did that kind of look like in general? Well, I guess I'll go from the audition before because during Kansas City, I was I had just taken an audition for Atlanta that happened like a month or two before. And it was a pretty similar list. So it was I was in good shape for Kansas City. But I'd say maybe six weeks out. I'm it probably starts before that. But just doing scales and arpeggios with the same sort of focus and heightened perception that you're trying to make them just as good you know, or better than the excerpts that you're doing. The scales for me are just so important, you know, scales and arpeggios and just trying to get better before the audition, you know, so I'd be doing that for two weeks. This would be maybe like eight weeks out or something. And then six weeks, I make sure that I get organized, uh, especially if I have the list. I think the first thing I do is make a book just so that everything is in place. I know exactly what I'm going to be playing. It's in a book, it's organized. You know, I always have a journal, but the six weeks out, I'm taking everything pretty slowly, I'd say, putting them in categories also, the excerpts that I was doing. So the idea of organizing everything goes even further than that. But I would make an ABC list, you know, of, of excerpts that I was doing. So A's being excerpts that I was really, you know, that I could probably just take out my bass now and play and be happy with the result. B list being things that I, there's still certain things that are you know, catching or, or that I'm not so sure about. And so, and then the C list being things that I really need to focus on. And I would kind of make this list a day to day thing. So a list, I would, you know, practice every three days, B list I'd practice every other day, C list would be an everyday thing. And then you change it every week, you know, because it, it happens quickly that your C's become B's or, you know, vice versa sometimes. And so it's good <laughs> to just be aware of that. And just taking it really slowly for six weeks out, just kind of, I mean, even quarter note 50. And then at the end of the week, if I'm at 55, I take it back to 50 sometimes. And then doing that for a couple of weeks, listening to a lot of music of the composers, not necessarily the specific pieces that I'm playing, but other music, you know, string quartets of Beethoven, if I'm playing, you know, that's going to be on every list. So you're getting used to that or, you know, getting that music, his music in your head and finding that style, just getting so acquainted with it early on. And maybe four weeks out, you know, the tempos are getting higher and I'm, I'm starting to play things through, you know, measure by measure, not necessarily through all the way. And then the practice slowly becomes different. It becomes less about, you know, accuracy and it becomes about how am I going to approach this excerpt in tempo and how can I practice that exact same thing slowly? Mm. So I, I think what I found over time is I was practicing things slowly, right? But I was practicing them slowly in a way that was whenever I would put it into tempo, it would be kind of flat musically and it would be kind of, it felt foreign sometimes. And because I wasn't practicing it exactly how I would play it in tempo slowly. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah adding vibrato when it's slow 
you know, the musical direction has to be there slowly. So it's more slow motion than practicing it slowly. Because when I felt like I was practicing deliberate but slowly, then I would pick it up in tempo and I'd be more confident that way. I like that idea of yeah. the practicing in slow motion. That's 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 great. At what point do you start to play for people? You know, because it sounds like it's kind of cut up at, at slow motion. At, at what point in that whole process do you start uh, t- taking the excerpts out and playing them for people? Probably it depends. I mean, sometimes I feel more comfortable playing certain things. And if I have five or six excerpts that I'm comfortable playing with, I'll start playing for people three weeks out. Cool. But a lot of times it starts happening two weeks where I'll be running a list. And during that time, I'm always recording every single run through. And so two weeks out, I start playing for people and especially playing for, uh, you know, wind players, violin players, other string players, not just bass players. I think that's a big important thing. I think on that idea that we get sort of put in this bass culture sometimes during auditions and and we know how certain excerpts go in the bass culture, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and how bass players like to play it. I think it's really important to get out of that because, you know, so many times I'd be playing an excerpt and I'd listen back and I'm just like, oh, that sounds like a machine gun, you know, or that's – and sometimes that can be cool. To, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it. Bass players, we – there's certain things that we like that don't necessarily translate to other musicians. Mm-hmm. And so it's just good to get that other side of things. But yeah, two weeks, two weeks out, I'll start playing for people. And then 10 days out is when I start to wake up in the morning and, and make sure that I'm, you know, I stretch, but I don't warm up and I record and run through everything. And then I wait, you know, 30 minutes and go back and listen to it and then work on some things and record it again. So I do that twice a day. And then I do that, you know, 10 days out eight days out, six days out. I do that same thing until the week of, I really start to go back to the slow practice and taking it easy for the most part, because a lot of the times early on in auditions, I would get so tired that a couple days before, especially my left hand. Mm. So it's hard to play in tune and definitely three days into it or two days into it. I'm not really running much of anything. I'm just trying to build confidence through the slow motion practice. And, you know, mentally, if I start running things and I'm messing things up two days before, that just does a whole lot of damage to me mentally, especially in the warm up room. So I try not to run things that close to an audition. We were talking about this before I flipped on the mic, but I, you know, I went down and was talking with David Allen Moore at USC and he had a couple ideas of, of things that would be interesting to talk about. And yeah. So like, how do you stay focused when life gets in the way as you're preparing for an audition? You wake up and you're in a bad mood or like things are tense or that excerpt that's like felt great. Like you're playing Mozart 35 and all of a sudden you're cacking it after like it was on your A list. And now all of a sudden it goes on your C list. I mean, those are the sort of things that it's such a tough, it's like training for the Olympics, right? This sort of thing. And like, those frustrations that come in, especially for something that's so high pressure, right? It's like your future, your employment, like how, and, and it's a, it's a tough question to answer, but, but like, how did you manage those inevitable frustrations you must've had? Yeah. It's really easy to get frustrated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I think what I tried to do, especially in the last in Kansas city, which I felt helped with the success of it was this idea of cognitive shifting. I, I know that sounds like a fancy way of just basically like mental replacement. So it's so easy to get down on yourself, right? It's so easy to get in that self-loathing, self-doubt because that just affects all of us. And and I was just thinking of ways to combat that. So um, because that was a huge part of it for me is it would be I'd be so confident some days and then the next day I'd be like, I'm never going to want a job. I'm never going to, you know, do this and that. But instead of thinking about that, probably a month before I started just changing that idea. So if I had that thought appear, I would just replace it with something more positive and more helpful because whenever you have those thoughts, even if they were true, they're not helpful at all to your audition process, right? Yeah. So instead of, I'm not sure about this shift and I don't think that it would be successful Uh, If I were to play it, you know, in the audition right now, instead of thinking that, you know, the negative thought, think, how could I make that shift more comfortable? And just that slight shift of, 
of wording, you know, that, and, and, and it seems like such a small thing, but after a while you get so good at that, that it becomes second nature that you start to only think helpful thoughts about the audition, Mm -hmm. especially if you're putting it to daily practice, like you would anything else. So I think you really have to work on the mental preparation too, uh, in that way, making sure you be careful of what enters your mind in the, in the audition process, especially in the practice room, especially when you're running things for people, you know, think only helpful thoughts and, and really try to get good at that mental replacement. I like that. I like that, that wording mental replacement. Yeah. Cause it's like, a it's like anything. It's like, it's like a muscle, like you exercise that, yeah. that, and, and you get good at it. And all of a sudden it's just like a, a habit you've developed just to shift that yeah. over. That's awesome. Yeah, I know that that seems like this, you know, like hippy dippy idea, but it's it really helps out a lot, especially, you know, it but it does have to be put into practice like anything else. It can't you can't just get there the week before and start being positive because <laughs> you haven't practiced it and I it's just like anything else, you know. Oh, totally. Uh, um now Outside of the practice room, like a lot of people I talk to, they're exercising regularly or they do yoga or they do some meditation or they're, or they're reading about books on athletic performance or that sort of thing. What outside of the practice room did you do that you found helpful? Well, it's been said before, I, I, I ran and I still run a lot almost every day. And I think for me, because I, I have a lot of energy that I just have to get out. Yeah, especially days before the audition. So I was running uh, almost every day up until the audition and running both mornings of the audition that I was doing. And I found that just so good for focus and and great for, you know, if you feel well, you're going to play better. And it just got rid of some of those, some of that extra energy that I didn't need. It's just going to contribute to nerves. Uh, And I, I made sure that I ate pretty healthy for the most part. You know, sometimes you have to, you know, I was here, I ate some barbecue while I was here for the audition. I had a beer or something, you know, mm-hmm. you know, keep the alcohol content low, but yeah, just those little things. I, I made sure that I tried to get out and enjoy myself every once in a while. You know, finding that balance is so difficult with an audition process because you feel guilty so much of the time when you're not practicing. But I think it's really helpful, especially spending time with people, with friends and, and family. Mm-hmm. I think you have to do that for me and for just the overall mental health of an audition process. Yeah. So eating healthy, I ran a lot. I made sure that I was getting out and enjoying my life also. No, that's huge though. I mean, th- those are the sort of things I think people forget about. And I love hearing that you ran the day of the audition. That reminds me, I was talking to Joe, Joe Conyers and, and he was talking to me about his, his Philly orchestra when he, when he got that. He just decided, he realized, don't treat it like a, like a different day. Why are you doing that? You know, in, just yeah. live your life, uh, eat food, you know, have good habits, but, but um, you build it's like you build this thing up and if you don't spend time with your family and your friends and do that sort of thing, I mean, you're, it's, it is affecting your audition negatively. Yeah. Yeah. You have to you find that balance of living your life. And I, I heard that uh, interview and he's so right about that. If you spend those two days differently, it's going to feel so foreign. It's going to feel almost too different and it's, you're going to put so much pressure on it. And I, you already have enough pressure, pressure on the audition <laughs> by, by spending money and, is spending, you know, a lot of money and going to these hotels and being in a foreign city that you don't really know very well. And, and I think, yeah, it's very, whatever you can do to make it feel like any other day in your life yeah. is probably the best thing for you to do. You know, I, I, I tried to cut caffeine also, mm-hmm. uh, just a little bit before the audition, just because, I mean, I'm still trying to cut it. It's, it's an addiction, you know? <laughs> oh, I am. I got my coffee right here. I know. Yeah, so, I know. <laughs> uh, but you know, I try to keep it to one a day before the audition and maybe half a day if I, you know, if I didn't cut it out completely. But just, you know, little things like that. Yeah, but that's another a good point. Like, I remember taking auditions and it's like, and I'm a compulsive coffee drinker, right? And, I, and all of a sudden, I'm not drinking coffee and I'm eating like four bananas. And I just felt awful because it's like, that's not what I do, you know? <laughs> So it's like, yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I cannot eat a banana to this day. It's because I, 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 if I eat a banana, I think, oh, now I've got to go audition. I have associated bananas and auditioning in my mind. It's, it's, it's a oh. sickness. <laughs> That's great. I, 
<laughs> I've never heard of that. That's that's yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have this association with auditions, and now they just can't eat a certain thing. Oh, or do a certain thing. Yeah. yeah. No, it's something that they drilled into us at Northwestern. I don't remember. I was taking some auditioning class, and they said, oh, there's some – I don't remember what it is in bananas that's supposed to chill you out. But So I would do that all the time. I remember, like, driving to the audition, and I had, like, my – like, bunch of bananas, and I hadn't had my coffee, and I – it's uh, – Yeah. So, so you're, I mean, you're, you're still a young guy, but I still, I, I, I'd love to know if, if you could just go back and, and have a chat with like, let's just say 18 year old Caleb, what, what (laughs) advice, what what advice might you give, uh, that, that version of yourself? Oh man, so much advice. Uh, (laughs) yeah, I, that's a hard one to, to really like hone in on. Yeah, I know. I would say that the success is going to come and go, right? I I think when you're young and and you, it's so easy to take things personally and it's so easy to just make it, make a drama out of things, you know? Being focused on the work and, and in every form of that word, just being so focused on the work and not worrying about winning or success or any of that and just really being true and honest to the work that you're doing and the the music that you want to make that's more important than anything else for me especially nowadays i find more joy in that now and and yes you want to make a living as a musician and but i would really tell him that you know just focus on your work don't focus on 10 years in the future where you want to be uh have goals obviously and write those goals down and try and succeed in those goals but don't make that all it's about and whether or not you get into this festival or that festival and getting so down on yourself because, you know, we're so lucky to be doing this anyways. And I think we forget that so much of the time you forget that you're just so lucky to be doing this and be a part of this life. So, you know, just focus on the work, feel grateful, work really hard, take responsibility for yourself. That's, you know, that's another big one. Take responsibility for the work that you do. You know, it's ultimately up to you and, yeah, those are some of the few. <laughs> that's no, that's 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 good stuff. Very very bu- very Buddhist uh, thoughts, you know. <laughs> like, I, no, it's great, man. Yeah, cool. Is there anything else you want to get out there uh, for for? But I mean, this th- we're we're hitting. We're hitting great stuff. You're you're a great interview, by the way, man. This is this is a lot. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> I know. I my my uh, articulation sometimes is I get on these rants because you're trying to like organize all of what happened in the past three years for these auditions, and you're like, oh man, there's so much that I did. So much. How could I focus on and and put it into like a you know this kind of cohesive you know organized list of things? But I hope hopefully I hit some good good things you know oh no it's absolutely great well thank you so much caleb and check out the show notes for links to caleb's kansas city page and other things that we talked about here in the show and if you haven't checked it out you probably know if you follow this podcast for any length of time but i did put together a book called winning the audition recently and you can find that book at winning the i talked to dozens of audition winners from major orchestras in the United States and outside, and we we cover what are the most common ways that successful audition winners prepared, what kind of mindset did they get into when they were having their audition success, what advice would they offer people, and what do they hear behind the screen now that they're on the other side. This book has gotten a great reception. You can check it out. The Some of the co- comments, the things that we were talking about with Caleb – also covered in this book. So I was so happy to put this together. It was one of my big projects of 2016. And if you haven't picked up a copy, check it out. And there is a podcast series, a four podcast series about all the topics we cover with these dozens of people. So you can hear the audio, you can get the book and all that info at winningtheaudition.net. And that's going to do it for another episode of Contrabass Conversations. If you'd like to support the show in any way, money-wise or time-wise or all sorts of ways that you can support the show, that's all listed at ContrabassConversations.com slash support. So thank you so much for following along. So excited to be coming up on this big anniversary. 
more info on what we're going to do for that soon. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Bye.